Bree Stenzrud here, and today in this video segment, we are going to be learning about U.S. immigration policy. And U.S. immigration policy is really complicated. I mean, there's lawyers for this subject matter. So I'm thrilled that one of our supporting partners at Women of Welcome is World Relief. And we're going to be talking with a really good friend of Women of Welcome, and that is the Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Policy, Jenny Yang. Jenny, good to see you. Hey, Brie, how are you? I'm good. Okay, so here's one thing that I just want to like get off um, the table first, and that is, is that U.S. immigration policy is just constantly changing. So as we film this today, it's, I mean, it could change in a little bit, but there's some foundational things that don't change. I mean, what are you, what are you really going to help us kind of see today, even when, with all the changes happening? Well, Brie, I think that is a wonderful question to ask because from the founding of our country, even up until now, We've always grappled with this question of who we are, how many people do we let in, who is really an American, and all of that is fundamentally tied to our immigration system. And when you look at our history around uh, how many people we have let in and the laws associated with immigration, that has always changed throughout time. And you cannot disconnect immigration to uh, questions around race or economics or national security because these are all issues that are fundamentally tied together. And so as we think about our current immigration system and how do we move forward and how do we create a system that really reflects our values, not only as Americans, but as Christians, I think there are fundamental values we need to have at play in these conversations so that we can continue to craft a system that reflects and affirms the dignity of, of each individual made in the image of God, but also reflects the needs of families already in the United States and the needs of our economy as well. So these are all questions that I think we continue to grapple with that we as Christians need to grapple with. Um, but we also know that our elected officials are continuing to have these questions in their head. And it's our responsibility as citizens to be able to inform some of these conversations, um, but also to have our responses be rooted in an understanding of the history of immigration to this country and also a little bit about how our current immigration laws work right now. That's great, Jenny. I'm excited. So help us understand the historical context and then how that brought us to where we currently are today. So the United States has always grappled with this question of who do we let in and how many people do we let in? And it's really from the founding of our country that we grapple with this question. So I want to first off acknowledge that our country wasn't discovered, that the United States of America was founded by uh, by pilgrims who came to a land that was already occupied. And so I think the first instance of immigration to the United States was the pilgrims. Um, and they were, um, you know, they clashed with the in individuals that had already lived in the United States. And so when we talk about immigration, we have to recognize that the first immigrants were the pilgrims that came to the United States. Uh, and so I think it's important to acknowledge the Native American experience and the Native American story when it comes to immigration. Um, and because the first pilgrims could have been the first in cases of illegal immigration to the United States because they were occupying um, and coming to a land that was um, already occupied. And so uh, from that history of, of the pilgrims coming here, you see some of our forefathers that really grapple with this question of, of the people that should make up the United States of America. And so uh, George Washington, actually the first president of the United States, um, early on was addressing a group of Irish immigrants when he said that the bosom of America should be open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, uh, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. And there was a sense from his remarks that the United States of America should really be open to welcoming anyone who was uh, willing to come and that there should be this tradition of welcoming those who are persecuted as well. But at the same time, Benjamin Franklin was addressing um, and talking about immigration to the larger public. And he thought that German immigrants were invading uh, the United States. He thought that uh, the Pennsylvania, which is a colony that was founded by the Engl English, would be outnumbered by German immigrants. And he had concerns about the fact that German immigrants, they couldn't speak English, they spoke German. And he expressed concerns about the, the color of their complexion. Uh, these days, we couldn't really distinguish uh, between Germans and English in terms of their skin complexities. But at that time, it was a big issue. 
And so, again, from the founding of our country in the late 1700s, uh, there was this constant debate about who would make up America, whom we should let in. And even from the leading figures of our time, uh, the, the, the first president of the United States and even Benjamin Franklin, there were conflicting views of what that should actually look like. Um, but what you see throughout the late 1700s and into the early 1800s is the fact that there were waves of immigrants that came to the United States. It was this land that was really open to anyone who was willing to come into the United States. Um, and so not only did you have the pull factor of this, this great and kind of rich land that was new, but you had the push factors of individuals that were fleeing poverty, that were fleeing political conflict. And so through the 1820s to the 1860s, you had a lot of Irish and German immigrants who were fleeing famine and filled political coups to come to the United States. And in fact, when a lot of Irish immigrants came, they weren't welcomed. In fact, there were signs throughout very various businesses throughout the United States that um, said that no Irish need apply, uh, that there was discrimination against the Irish because they were mostly Catholic. Uh, and so, and with the Germans, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, there was a lot of concern that they looked different than the English, that they couldn't speak English, that they spoke German. And so there was a lot of concerns around these waves of immigrants that came in. And the Irish and Germans were mostly desperately poor. Um, they were fleeing famine and they really tried to were coming to the United States to escape the circumstances as well. But at the late 1800s, you see this really growing, expanded economy in the United States um, with different industries developing and, and this um, desire for the country to uh, build the transcontinental railroad. But in doing that, there wasn't enough labor for the transcontinental railroad to be built. And so a lot of Chinese immigrants actually came into the United States in the 1840s, 1850s, and they started building the transcontinental railroad. And it really led to successive waves of large numbers of Chinese immigrants coming into the United States. But in 1882, there was a sense in the country that there were too many Chinese immigrants. By then, the Continental Railroad had been built, and there was a sense that we didn't need these laborers anymore because they looked different than everybody else, and they didn't speak English. Again, again the same sentiment that we see um, being talked about. And so Congress actually passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which effectively excluded Chinese immigrants from being able to come into the United States of America. And that law was in the books for over 60 years before it was officially repealed in 1943. Uh, and so there was a time period in which uh, the United States was excluding Chinese immigrants. And it was actually the first instance in which a specific race was excluded from immigrating to the United States of America. Um, but really, it was actually during this time, same time period where we see large waves of immigrants coming to the United States again, uh, in which it, in what we call the second wave of immigration to the United States, where a lot of immigrants were actually coming through Ellis Island. And we had a lot of immigrants, not just from Ireland and Germany that were coming, but from Southern Europe, um, from Italy and other places, um, and Eastern Europe that were coming in through Ellis Island at that time. And so that was, again, another concern, because not only were a lot of uh, people in the United States concerned about a Chinese immigrants, but there was a sense that we didn't want immigrants coming from um, Southern and Eastern Europe because they were desperately poor and they, again, couldn't speak English and they couldn't assimilate into the United States. And so in 1924, this is while the Chinese Exclusion Act was also still in place, um, the Congress actually passed the National Origins Quota Act, which basically closed off most immigration to the United States uh, for the next four decades, except for immigrants that were coming from the Western Hemisphere. So this effectively excluded most um, immigrants from Asia, and it also excluded most immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, which really shut out Italians, Greeks, and Jews from being able to immigrate to the United States of America. And that was the, the law of the land for, for many, many years in the United States until the 1960s. Um, and when you understand what's happening in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, it was really at a time of, of active discussion around civil rights. And when the Civil Rights Act passed um, in the mid-1960s, it was also... Uh, the United States was having conversations around, well, if we are trying to pursue civil rights for individuals already within the United States, then we can't have laws on the books 
that are effectively excluding people based on your race from being able to come into the United States. And so Congress actually abolished the quotas and said, well, if we're going to let people in, it shouldn't be based on their nationality or their race. It should be based on their um, ability to be employed in the United States and on family values. And so the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 was passed in which they basically said, if you have a close family member in the United States, then you should be able to come into the U.S. They should be able to petition for you. Um, and the second criteria was if you can be sponsored by a U.S. company or a U.S. employer, then that should allow you to also be able to be uh, able to be uh, petitioned for to come to the United States. And that really began and is a foundation for our current immigration system, is a values-based immigration system where if you have family member in the U.S., or you have an employer who can sponsor you, that is the two ways that you can actually come in into the United States of America. And so even today, when you look at our current immigration system, you see a system that is based on the values of family and based on the values of work. Now, we also have a small category uh, allowed for individuals that are fleeing persecution to be able to enter the United States of America. And so the United States actually has a program called the U.S. Refugee Emissions Program, where we allow small numbers of individuals who are selected by the U.S. government uh, who are fleeing persecution to be able to be resettled to the United States. At World Relief, we're one of the nine agencies that resettles refugees in partnership with local churches. But this is also an important part of U.S. tradition and U.S. history because the ability for the United States to welcome those who are persecuted who have really nowhere else to go as a really important part of our ability to protect those who are fleeing persecution, um, especially when we know that many of these individuals really um, cannot return home or cannot locally integrate into the places to which they fled. And so I think these core aspects of our current immigration system are important to preserve as we think about what it looks like in terms of future changes to our immigration system, because when we, we want to keep the core values of family and work at the center of our immigration system, while also making sure that we offer protections to those who are fleeing persecution uh, and really um, their lives are in danger because of aspects of the, who they are and their core identity. So, um, so I think it's important to remember the history of immigration to the United States because it does color um, our ability to um, um, remember that history and to not repeat the mistakes that we've made in the past, um, but also to preserve the values that we believe are critical to shaping our current immigration system today. Okay, Jenny, that was so helpful. I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. Um, so thank you so much. Um, one question that I think uh, I frequently get is, well, these are the avenues in which to come. If you don't meet those if you can't get into one of those lanes, then then you shouldn't come. And so what would you say, what would be your response to that if someone were to say that to you? Well, I think it, it's, it's a matter of understanding, well, what do the lanes look like? Because if you're talking about getting into a lane that is so narrow that no one can stand in that lane, then there really technically is no lane to get into. And when you look at our, our employment-based immigration, I think that's mostly what people are referring to. You look at some of the industries in our country that rely heavily on immigrant labor. So whether it's the hospitality industry, whether it's the construction industry, or um, the, or a lot of other industries, you realize that there a lot of them are made up of immigrant workers. And a lot of these business leaders are advocating uh, with their members of Congress themselves because they realize they they don't they can't sponsor immigrants to come into their program. There are no visas available. And the visa programs that are available, the slots get filled up so quickly that it's it's, it's so impossible for companies to, uh, to hire these workers. And so, yes, it would be nice to say, get to the back of the line, but really technically there is no line to get into. Um, and I think that aspect of our immigration system is, is oftentimes overlooked. Both parties, the Democrats and Republicans have acknowledged that this is a challenge. And so when we talk about immigration reform, there has been this look at, well, how do you open up avenues for more immigrants who are eligible and skilled to be able to come into the United States of America? And when you look actually at the undocumented immigrant population, uh, there was a certain time period in which 94% of undocumented males were working in this country. And, uh, and a lot of them in the process of working, get married, have children. And so most of the undocumented immigrants in our country today have actually been here for longer than a decade. 
And so many of these individuals came in when our economy was booming, when there were jobs available. It's just that our immigration laws have not synced up with the, the labor needs of our economy. And so you have this mismatch of, of economic needs and the pull versus the push of, of individuals wanting to come. And so I think it's it's been the job of Congress, who has debated this for many years, to, to fix that, to have that be a match so that immigrants who are wanting to find a job and companies that need that can find legal avenues through which they can allow those people to come. Yeah, and I guess some people would say, well, I mean, the, those lanes are in place and those lines are in place and those numbers are in place. And so um, we have enough. It's not like we need to like open up. It's almost like people are very nervous to kind of uh, change what's currently there because what's currently there was, was um, was put in place for a reason. So why is there a, a need to kind of open up some of those lanes or to fix those lanes? And so what I hear you saying is there is an economic demand um, that we have in this country. And so that all kind of uh, goes back to, there's there's really only four ways, the way I kind of heard you say this, and, I, and I've heard this before, tell me if you've heard this before, there's really kind of four ways to come into the US legally, and that is blood, sweat, tears or the lottery, right? So blood would be if you're family, you know, family immigration. Then you have sweat is that you're working in this country and tears would be that asylum. Uh, you're seeking asylum and you're applying to come in for refuge in this country. And then the lottery. Tell us a little bit about like the lottery. Yeah, so the diversity leader uh, visa lottery uh, was is a program that's run by the State Department to allow individuals who come from non-represented communities across the United States to apply for a visa to come into the United States. It really places the emphasis on allowing individuals that probably would have no other opportunity to come into this country to make it. And so uh, the chances of, so this is a program run by the State Department. You have to apply through a visa um, at a U.S. embassy and the chances of getting it are about one in 340 or something. Um, and so the chances of, of uh, getting this lottery are very slim and you have to be from a country that's underrepresented in the United States. Uh, and so uh, individuals um, from like Ghana have come in um, and um, I've met an individual from like Turkmenistan uh, a year ago, I believe, who was our who was my Uber driver. And so you have these individuals who are coming from countries that are underrepresented in the U.S. Uh, but again, it's a very small um, uh, immigration program. I believe it's only 50,000 visas per year. And um but again, I think you know, the majority of immigrants that are coming in is through the family-based and employment-based uh, immigration system. Yeah, and I would say most people that I talk to about the family-based immigration is when you tell them it takes about an average of 10 years and it costs anywhere from 10 to $15,000. And that, that's kind of the struggle and that's the line that you're getting into. Most Americans would be like, that's unacceptable. That's, that's crazy. Um, what do you do to solution that that lane? The, the, yeah, so, well, it's it's interesting when you look at the the groups that have been advocating for higher numbers of immigrants to come into the United States. It's it's a pretty eclectic mix. It's it's like Microsoft and Apple and these tech companies that utilize a lot of immigrant workers as software engineers and other people that with with high skills. Um, but you also have people like, you know, farm workers or, or farmers who are wanting to hire more immigrants to work their fields and, and pick produce from the fields. Um, but then you also have uh, other groups, uh, immigrants themselves who are dreamers and others who are making up a lot of the immigration um, advocacy community as well. And so the commonality between all these employers when it comes to reforming our employment based immigration system is we need more visas. And so there's been uh, discussions with Congress of how do you increase the number of visas that are available for high skilled workers? How do you expand the number of low skilled workers that are coming in to immigrate on a permanent visa uh, or on a permanent basis? I mentioned before that there's only 5,000 visas available for low skilled workers to immigrate permanently into the United States. And so how do you increase that number? Um, and so there's also guest worker programs. There's individuals who come to the United States on a temporary visa in order to work in the United States and then, you know, they leave. Uh, and there's also been conversations, well, how do you increase the number of visas available uh, through our guest worker program for individuals that come in and work temporarily in the United States? And so there's various proposals on the table. The numbers are always going to 
change. I think the challenge with our immigration system now is that once Congress sets a number, that's a number that's set in law for 20, 30 years, even though our, our demands are changing. And so there's been ideas of a commission that's created that would set flexible numbers every year, depending on our economy. And I think ideas like that are all being considered and need to continue to be debated as, as we think about what the right levels are. No one has an answer about the set number that's right for a country. It changes, but I think everyone recognizes that the numbers we have now are not working. They're not working for our economy. They're not working for the global dynamics and humanitarian needs that are out there. Uh, you, when is the last time there has been major immigration reform? When was the last time that happened? Well, I mentioned the 1965 Immigration and National, um, Naturalization Act, which basically provides the premise through which immigration can happen to the U.S. It's it's the the blood and the sweat, as you were mentioning. Uh, but also, uh, we've also had significant legislation at other times. I would say the, the next big uh, legislation we saw was um, in 1986, when Ronald Reagan actually passed a legalization where around 3 million undocumented immigrants at that time became uh, legalized. And so uh, it was interesting to have him leading the charge because he was the governor of California. He understood some of the personal stories uh, of immigrants that were contributing to the California state economy. And so it was really from that perspective that he led a bipartisan effort to legalize these nearly 3 million immigrants. And it was also at that time when they said, well, how do you make sure that, you know, we, we don't, we allow people to immigrate the legal way. And so there were some changes the legal system. But again, it didn't really uh, account for the needs of our economy and then continuing need for changes throughout the many, many years. And so again, it's it really led to us right now having a large pool of undocumented immigrants. Um, and so I, I think it's important to remember that when you look at the waves of immigrants, of immigration to the United States, it's often reflective of our U.S. economy. So the, at times when our U.S. economy has been booming, there's been more increased immigration because people are responding to that and looking for jobs and coming into work jobs. But at times when there has been a dip in the economy, you also see a correlating dip in immigration as well because there's lesser jobs for people to fill. And so you have this the trend of immigration following our, our U.S. economy economic trends. Um, but you what you also see is that especially at our border where you see a lot of immigrants trying to or asylum seekers trying to come in that it's also indicative of our global uh, political uh, affairs and so individuals who cannot stay in their home countries and are seeking asylum that they're they're trying to cross the border in order to find safety as well so jenny i have a couple more questions but you said something kind of at the very beginning of your talk you said something about there are injustices baked into our U.S. immigration system. Can you tell me just a little bit more about that? That really piqued my interest. Yeah, when you look at our current immigration system or even the way that we've structured immigration in the past, it's always, I think, been a response to our, our fear of the other. And, and by that, I mean, when you see laws that exclude people just because of the place where they come from, uh, that is, I believe, racism baked into the system. The fact that for over... 50 years, we we excluded Chinese immigrants from coming to the United States, even though they were valuable workers, um, or even when we, over the past few years, have separated children from their parents, completely antithetical to American values at the border, it, it really calls into question, well, why are we doing these things? Are we doing it because it makes us more, secu more secure and more safe? Um, even when it robs the dignity of the individuals whom we're excluding or families that we're separating. And so I think the hard part is, is that in this question of, well, who is American and who do we let in? There has always been the sense that, well, we, we need to exclude others uh, based on you know their race, their class, et cetera, et cetera. And when you see that our immigration system preferenced individuals from Europe, a lot of times in our current immigration conversations, we elevate uh, certain immigrants to say, well, they did it the right way when actually the system was weighted against those who didn't do it, quote unquote, the, the, the right way. Um, and so I think we have to recognize that. We have to recognize how race plays a com uh, uh, into this conversation around immigration, how economics plays into this. But I think what's really important is that we always have a values-based conversation where we affirm the dignity of those who are trying to come into the United States. We recognize our history, but we also uh, re uh, 
we see that for someone to come in and want to work, we see someone trying to come in to want to be with family, that those are valued reasons for people to want to come. And I think for us to, to elevate those values in this conversation, um, in addition to preserving protection for those who cannot find safety elsewhere, that those are significant principles that we have to maintain when it comes to any debate around immigration. And I guess what I would say is when you talk to immigrants, no one wants to come illegally. They don't love they don't want to come here and live in the shadows. They want to do it the right way. And most of the time it's just out of sheer desperation for providing for their families um, or fleeing persecution or violence of some sort that they they're literally just trying to survive. And so for them, they I've never heard of an immigrant who was was proud of coming here in that way. I mean, it's a it's a very hard thing because they're they've got two they've got multiple dynamics that they're dealing with and they and they are truly just trying to survive and flourish and help their families flourish. And so I think sometimes um, we have to, like you said, recognize the dignity of that person. That person is made in the image of God, and and something is driving them um, to help meet a need or to help their family flourish. And so. No one likes living in the shadows of a society. They, they want to be part of society. They, they want to be welcome and accepted. And a lot of times people aren't very welcoming, even if they do come the legal way. A lot of times people will say, I'm, I'm good with immigrants as long as they come the legal way. And then I would say, yeah, well, that's great. But I would just tell you that there's a lot of immigrants who live in our country that have never actually been welcomed or, or feel welcomed or been in an American home. What would you say to that? Do you feel that as well? Yeah, I definitely think for a lot of us, we feel like legality equals morality. That that just because the law dict the law does not dictate human worth. And a lot of times, I think as Americans, we default into thinking that our laws are perfect when they are not. And so I think yes, there is this question of well, how do we change the laws to allow individuals to immigrate legally to the United States? But the broader question I think for us as a church is. What, how do we respond, even if someone is here undocumented? And it's interesting, over the years, I've had conversations with uh, youth pastors um, and with ministry leaders who have actually had pastors come up and, and say, well, I don't know if I should you know, serve communion to this undocumented immigrant because he's breaking the law. Um, and actually, we had one, I had one youth pastor in his campus ministry who reported um, a student in his ministry to ICE because he was undocumented, and he really felt like, and it was, I, it was just so awful because it was shortly after the student was sharing about the troubles and the challenges he's had because of his immigration status to his youth pastor, and instead of responding with compassion and the love of Christ, this person reported this individual to the authorities, and in my mind, that is the antithesis of what I believe Jesus would do, and. I, I, it troubles me that I think we place the rule of law above our care and concern for an individual. And, and so, yes, I think we have to do everything we can to get, to get the law right and to make the lanes and the, the lines available for individuals to come into the United States and, and, and pursue citizenship. Um, at the same time, I think when we realize how broken the system is, there's no legal right to come. And considering the significant challenges that many families have faced that many of us will never face and the decisions they had to make uh, to, to protect and provide for their families, I don't think we should put ourselves above that situation to think that we would have been morally superior by not breaking the law. And so I think there has to be more empathy in some of these conversations, um, as well as to recognize that laws have changed within this country all the time. Whenever they're not right, they have been changed. And we've had terrible laws in our country. We've had laws that said segregation was okay. We've had laws that said slavery was legal. And so I think our laws constantly need to be changing and uh, we can't put the rule of law above our love for the other. I think that's really good. And I, I just wanna be clear because I think some people would think, well, we have to be our, our laws. And what about you know Romans 13 and all of these things? And we're gonna have another video about that very thing. So stick with us if you're doing that. That's another segment that you'll get to in this journey um, of education that we have. So we're not promoting or condoning illegal immigration, but what we are saying is, is to be moved with compassion first. 
And I remember attending a conference and I was listening to a pastor say, you know what the number one thing most of my congregants, who were mostly um, Hispanic and from uh, South America, Central America and Mexico, and he was saying, you know what the number one thing my congregants want to do is they want to drive to church together on Sunday morning. And I'm thinking, what, is he, what does he mean by that? And it's that the parents are, are driving, they're a mixed status family. You know, maybe one or two parents have undocumented status and or they're here without status. And then you have got US born children. And so if someone was to get pulled over and detained or whatnot, someone could be deported. So what they're doing is they're driving to church in separate cars so that if someone is deported, half of the family gets is still able to stay in the US and make a living. And so what was so moving to me was and they're still doing it. They're still driving to church. Like that's the risk is that their family, half of their family could be broken up, separated, deported, and banned from coming back into the States. And yet their deep love for their faith and their conviction to be in a church community, um, they're willing to risk driving to church to be in that community together and where they might be separated. And it was just a huge like, wow, a lot of these immigrants that are here and living in the shadows are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and like you said, I think Jesus would be moved to compassion and then and figuring out how, how do we try and, and make this right with the law? Is there a way to make that right and assisting them in that, but seeing them as a person who is in need and is also created in the image of God would be the first response that we would hope the church would be moved to. Um, the, the last question I want to ask you is, is, you know, we've seen this over the years and, and you could probably provide a greater depth of context for this, but our immigration laws and the numbers that we allow into our country from year to year, from administration to administration, they really set the tone for the rest of the world. And we see that, you know, wherever we set our levels, we see other countries respond. Talk to us a little bit about how we really are the leaders kind of in the space and we could really create a lot of global change for very vulnerable people if we were to get this right? Yeah, thanks, Bree, for that question. I think it's an important question because we recognize in how we set our system up and our laws and policies that it's not just about who comes into the United States. It actually allows other countries to then expand their doors and welcome the stranger in their communities as well. And so the U.S. is unique in that we don't have that anyone can immigrate to the United States regardless of where you're coming from. And and if you're born in this country, you are a U.S. citizen. You're not defined by a, a blood lineage, lineage or anything like that. It really is dependent on the skills you have and the family relationships. And so when you look at the history of immigration to the United States, you've had waves of immigrants. And, and even now, where around 13 percent of our population is made up of immigrants, it's, it's what makes our nation strong. And I would say specifically regarding U.S. leadership on humanitarian issues, it's really critical because the U.S. has actually been the world leader when it comes to U.S. refugee settlement. We've resettled far greater numbers of refugees than any other country in the world. Unfortunately, uh, over the past few years, those numbers have been declining, but there is a recommitment uh, to, to re-engage and to resettle more refugees um, back to historical norms. And so I mentioned earlier that Early um, in the 1980s, we resettled over 200,000 Vietnamese refugees. And so I think we need to go back up to this historic norm of, of resettling greater numbers of refugees. And when we do that, other countries follow our lead. In fact, the years when we set the lowest refugee ceiling in 2018 and in 2019, uh, we actually saw a corresponding significant decline in other countries resettling refugees as well. So uh, the UN actually estimates that there was a, a decline of around 40% of slots available for refugees that could be resettled. And so there's absolutely no doubt that whatever the US does will have ripple effects across the country. So when we're setting the bar around both humanitarian standards as well as our current immigration policies, uh, other countries follow suit. The other thing I will add just as well is that a lot of times people have been saying, well, we need to cut family-based immigration um, in preference of, of economic immigration. So we shouldn't let in so many family members because you know we really actually need workers in our economy. But I would actually say that there's social value in having families be together that 
that the unit of the family is so important that that actually creates economic value, even though they're not coming in sponsored by a company. And so when I look at any immigrant community, the people that are taking care of kids are, are aunties and grandmas. Uh, the people that are opening small businesses are, you know, small families coming together to do it together. The idea that we need to cut family-based immigration system to preference economic based immigration system, I think is wrong headed because I think it undervalues the role that families have played in boosting our economy and in creating strong social fabrics of our society and in instilling family based values that we really uphold as we talk about what makes this country great. And so I, I hope that as we talk about immigration, that it's not just the high skilled workers that we want to immigrate only that we also talk about the values of families as well. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm sure as we talk about all these things, people are thinking about border security and they're thinking about all of these other kind of like flags that come up. And what I will tell you is, is we are making videos for all of those. So make sure that as you are going through this journey and this education portal that you're looking for those and you can click on those. Thank you, Jenny, for your time today. Thank you, Bree.